question is Health Cabinet Secretary Honorable Motahi Kagwe, and we're just having a look at the status of the healthcare sector, but most importantly, the disruptions that had been occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic now on our second year into the pandemic. So what are some of the lessons that we have learned from this? A lot of questions coming in, especially on the vaccination exercise. The CS is here to answer all that. And thank you so much, sir, for honestly agreeing to be part of this conversation. I'm, I'm greatly honored. The pleasure is all mine. Yes, and you know, it's, it's the first one that I'm having with you on this setup, especially after you, you know, got into this office sometimes in February 2020. So it's, it's a great honor. Thank you very much. much. Yes. So and, and I also want to congratulate you for coming out of COVID-19. <laughs> because, uh, you know, you're looking healthy, you're, you're looking... looking uh, but you are, you are, I envy the fact that you have developed all this hard immunity and you are strong. It's a mental, it's more of a mental issue. It's a mental issue. And the fact that you're able to, to fight the stigma because it's a matter of isolation. So the, I, I, as a patient, I felt like um, taking care of the patient is has everything to do with the recovery process and the mentality of this person. Yes. So if I f keep on feeling that I'm going to die, I'm really going to die because when you begin thinking about the chest pains, they literally come. So one of the one of the lessons yes. that we should uh, document and is if, and encourage is the fact that uh, even those people who have had po uh, positive, even those people who turned positive, it is that it is not the end of the world. You need to be mentally very strong. Yes. You need obviously to take care of your body. You need to, like, to take care of your diet yes. and just to take a lot of rest and essentially have a positive, you know, a positive attitude. Positive. That's lesson number one. And a positive attitude. And positivity. Positivity. Yes. Lesson number and, one. And rest. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's begin from um, February 2020. You know, you getting into the office, but there are already countries like Egypt that had reported, African countries that had reported COVID-19 cases. So at this time, had you maybe had, had it crossed your mind that we may find ourselves to where we were seeing countries like China were, or what was going through your mind at that? Time. Thank you very much, uh, Purity. I think that uh, to be uh, to be clear, I think the answer is no. You know, in January when I was appointed uh, to the position, I did not foresee that uh, there would be uh, this pandemic. Obviously, I knew about the Wuhan province in China, but as you know, there are many many pandemics that come out, uh, many viruses that uh, spread regionally. For example, if you look at the Ebola virus, it is spread somewhere in West Africa and kind of went away. If you look at SARS, it went, there's a time I think in Asia, some countries in Asia. You know, there has been all these things are spread in localized situations. So for me at that time, I honestly thought that it was going to be a localized uh, situation and that um, eventually, you know, the Wuhan, pre the, the Wuhan virus will be suppressed and we would be okay mm -hmm. and as as the health boss i would imagine and i would want to know when you received that call that uh the country has reported the first case of covid 19 you know and we like you said we are not prepared for this first i am sure there is the dilemma of informing kenyans because there was already a lot of anxiety among among the people what was going through your mind no, i didn't think like that i didn't think now you know this is a situation yeah. that uh, we can't handle i realized that as soon as uh, uh, the realization that this was going to be a pandemic and, uh, and it was not going to end quickly you know you you sit with that and you compose yourself and you say to yourself i am here and this is the challenge it is not the first time that one has faced this, these kind of challenges and therefore you say to yourself whatever comes i know i have a strong team i'm a spiritual person and we'll handle it one way or another what we cannot do is we cannot give up and we cannot let kenyans down 
That's really what I thought myself. And like you mentioned, initially there was a lot of misinformation, especially regarding COVID-19. I remember at some point uh, we were not putting on the mask. It was only for the healthcare workers. And then it got to a point that we all had to wear a mask. Maybe uh, let's talk about now what, re what advice is some of the strategies that we put as a country. Sometimes we have curfews, we have the lockdown restrictions. Yeah. Maybe uh, now do we have a more stable strategy and what really advises us into these restrictions that we one and a half years later we are still imposing when we were starting this whole thing there were two two situations one is that indeed there was no knowledge about this virus across the globe everybody was simply um, making it happen as it goes along and for us we decided that we were going to err on the side of caution rather than err on the side of liberalism so the reason why we contain people, quarantined individuals, particularly those who had been exposed, is because we knew we would not be able to take care of them if they fell sick. And uh, even the countries that thought that they would be able to take care of people if they fell sick en masse were totally overwhelmed, including places like the United States, Germany, Italy, people with the established and uh, you know world famous health facilities so for us we had no choice but to ensure that they do not the virus is not transmitted and you rightly said that we are more smarter sometime in march um we had a peak of the infection and the, even the some governors would say we don't even have the hospital beds right now uh, we expect as uh, maybe you can confirm to us like another peak is expected maybe sometime this year, this month um, what is our capacity as a as a country right now I think two things yes. you know I have said this from last year yeah. I have said that the counties you know must ensure that they have got sufficient capacity so that in the event of a problem we don't send people to night robbing that's number one number two is that there's this, this this tendency to think that if the private hospitals in nairobi have been overwhelmed then the nairobi has been overwhelmed at the time that you are saying that uh, we were at a peak for example i am aware that K ku ku you know kenyatta university hospital still had capacity because we are the ones who are monitoring it and we also have the capacity to extend it if the worst comes to the worst we have got capacity to extend it but what happens is that people go to private hospitals and therefore say now we are overwhelmed meanwhile had you spoken to uh, places like embo hospital which has got a fairly good um, uh, structure as well they were not overwhelmed the coast was not overwhelmed so at no time did we have the entire country being uh, having so many patients that people would not be able to go to a hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, speaking of the capacity, and thank you for the reassurance, especially to Kenyans. So what is the current status, uh, the COVID-19 status in the country, when you compare the 2021 and uh, 2020, maybe where would you say we are in terms of... Um, the status there's also the situation in kisumu currently would we say that we are at least in control for now we have contained it we continue to ask our people and especially the county governments to please quickly quickly uh, add in as much oxygen you know as we can into the counties and that's why you see me going around the country you know and we know we are doing that we have got more cap many times more capacity than we ever had in kenya I mean, when you think about even just one hospital, MTRH in Eldoret, you know, they can produce 2,000 liters of oxygen now per minute. Now, this is a capacity that we were not even thinking about, you know, when, uh, when we started off. So the, the long and short of it is that we have built a lot of capacity, but that does not mean that you cannot get overwhelmed. Because if the numbers, what we, the numbers can increase, to where they can overwhelm even the extra capacity that you have and that's why we have to balance between the capacity we are building and the illnesses we are getting and the illnesses that we can we are getting to reduce the illnesses that we are getting depends on people's discipline and them agreeing to adhere 
to the rules and regulations that we are making. And um, the efforts to control um, this pandemic, we have the vaccination drive by the world, you know, and, and we embarked on this journey as a country in, in March. Uh, we've had news, even the World Health Organization agreeing and accepting that uh, there, are, there is vaccine hesitancy all over the world. Maybe where we are now uh, and maybe what you projected, have you vaccinated enough people? Are people coming out? What is the behavior of people as far as your target uh, is concerned uh, as far as um, our target is concerned we are way below our target and the reason why we are below our target is because of supply constraints when we started off by now we are supposed to have received probably about 12 million doses from um, uh, the from India for AstraZeneca and as you well know we received 1 million and that's what, that, that was the end of it. So the rest of it, we are, to read, we are now to, to, to change our entire uh, management structure for how we are going to, to manage COVID-19 and which vaccines we are therefore going to use to vaccinate people. So in addition to that is the realization that we don't know how long people will continue to be vaccinated for. So we need a number of things. Number one, we engaged other vaccine producers, as in Pfizer, as in Johnson & Johnson, particularly. Th secondly, we also decided that we cannot just rely on the rest of the world to, pre to protect Kenyans and also our neighbors around us. So that is why we decided the cabinet made the decision that we are going to have uh, to our own production line for vaccines, starting with uh, what they call our form and fill uh, plant, where you buy vaccines in drums and then you pack and fill, because that is the most challenging aspect of, uh, of the production. And, and, and the beauty is that once you have that plant, then it won't just be for COVID-19. Even other vaccines like polio and so on, we are going to produce from the same. So these are some of what I call the silver lining you know from the pandemic the president spoke and said that um the government uh, hopes to vaccinate about 20 million uh, adults by june next year maybe what are some of the strategies how we, will the minister of health because i know this lies here ensure that 20 million adults are um, vaccinated by next year considering the challenges that you've posed on the shortage of vaccines around the world I think what is slowly happening is that the supply constraints are easing a little bit, you know, because a lot of uh, countries who produce those vaccines have also been vaccinating and have been fairly successful because they were waiting to give their own people before they supply anybody else. So that's why you are finding that there is more, uh, there is more vaccines now available generally. But there is also uh, the political fight that has been there against vaccine nationalism and vaccine apartheid. And I think that um, the idea is that I think the world has come to appreciate that even if you vaccinate one country in totality and you have not vaccinated the rest of the world, you're wasting your time. Because unless you live in a cocoon, you know, where your people will never move out and no visitors will ever come to you, you will still have these, these issues and these problems. Worse still, is the fact that uh, you might vaccinate your people and because we have not vaccinated other people they develop other variants that are not even going to be responsive to the vaccines that you have done so th this whole thing means that uh, for once we have to look at this virus and manage it from a global perspective not from an individual national perspective that is not to say that we are not responsible and you don't take responsibility as a government for your own citizens but i think it's good to look at it from from the wider uh from the wider view mm -hmm. the second thing is that um, our target to, to to vaccinate the 20 in fact is more than that a uh, million people is an easy one if we get the vaccines the structure that we have got and uh, the committee that we have got because we created a task force that is headed by Dr. Willis Akwale. And that task force has been extremely efficient in terms of developing the system that uh, we use to vaccinate.
the EU COVID-19 vaccination passport, you know, it's it's trying to, it's actually, there was a report that um, the AstraZeneca, that is maybe the countries that benefited from the COVID shield, then that is not acceptable. Maybe, is there something that governments are doing to address this? Because I understand most of the African nations are beneficiaries of the COVID shield program. It is not just the COVID, uh, the, the African nations, even countries in Europe you know, vaccinated using uh, the AstraZeneca va vaccine. Now, but what, from what my understanding of it is that it is really an approval issue where the Aspen, no, not the Aspen, the, 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 um, the Serum Institute in, uh, in India should have applied for European approval within Europe. And I believe that it is, a, so I, I think it's an approval issue which they are dealing with because unless it is clear what the reasons are, then this whole thing can begin to look political. And once it begins to be political, it opens a whole door that nobody can be able now to tackle because obviously what, for instance, there was this report about the Europeans saying to the British people that they cannot travel, you know, if they have been, if they have been vaccinated with AstraZeneca. Now, what is to stop the British people? from telling them, well, that's okay, but if you have been used, if you have used Mondana, then you can't come into Britain. Yeah. So you, you, you start a process, you know, that is vague and undefined mm -hmm. and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So I think it is, it, the, it is um, important for any nation taking any measures outside of the WHO uh, regulations to be, to, to be very clear why they are doing it and how they intend to handle the whole package. Mm -hmm. And lastly, on the same, um, the, some, some Asian countries that have uh, experiencing a surge of, in, of the infections have reported that um, the people fully vaccinated uh, using the AstraZeneca are still badly being affected by the, by the pandemic and others have even died from it. And they, they are now, you know, proposals that a third dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine could help? Well, it hasn't. I, I don't think the World Health Organization has uh, literally issued, you know, an approval per se, but global practice, there are a lot of people now across the world who are doing exactly what I had said then, even though everybody thought that it wasn't going to happen. But uh, I think that time might prove me right, yes. because uh, that is what is happening in a lot of parts of the world. And I think that sooner than later, the World Health Organization will also pronounce itself on the issue. Maybe are we looking at some reforms at the ministry because um, you said that we are now smarter with the, with the pandemic. When we began, we saw a lot of challenges, especially at the counties when it comes to taking care, if I may use that word, of the health workers. Uh, first and foremost, as you know, we hired more people. We hired more doctors, we hired more nurses, we hired more healthcare, healthcare workers, and we will continue to do so. Obviously, depending on the funding ability uh, of the country. That's one. The second thing is that uh, when it comes to equipment, we, were, we are not in the space that we are in last year. We have now got local production of uh, PPEs and the local production of a lot of the other materials. We continue to urge uh, that uh, we depend more on local production than anything imported. We want to support our factories. We want to, to support our manufacturers, particularly in the pharmaceutical sector. Because we learned, and I've said this many times, that it is possible for you to have the resources, but you don't get the products because of the situation across the world. Transport is a problem. Holding is a problem. So what you want to make sure is that let's encourage our people, let's encourage our pharmaceutical organizations to manufacture uh, within the country so that we can be able eventually not just to, Im to use them for ourselves but also to export you know to the region and, and, and elsewhere and we are already seeing that we have now got Kenyan companies we're exporting to Australia we're exporting to New Zealand we're exporting to uh, to Egypt you know another and, uh, and other countries around the world so we, we are making good progress on that one but the other thing is obviously the training you know continuous training continuous training is part of the reforms uh, that we are making and and then and then finally let's not forget that covid is not the only disease in kenya yeah covid is not the only disease we have got we have got cancer you know that is still uh, devastating us so even as we dealt with covid we did not stop 
reforms to make uh, also to fight the other diseases we have made fantastic progress in the reforms on cancer and i think that over the next one year or so before the end of this year kenyans will be very happy because they will actually get treatment in kenya that was not available to them at all mm -hmm. you know they used to go to india for certain things but the 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 the, the, the investments we are making in Kenya today, as far as the treatment of cancer is concerned, are such that by the end of the year, there will be that relief. But in addition to the investments in terms of uh, um, capacity, in terms of uh, equipment, is also the training up that we have embarked on, on our, for our own people. You know, it is not enough that you are saying we can deal with cancer because you have got the equipment. You need specialists, oncology specialists, you know, and then specific pancreatic cancer specialists, you know, uterus cancer specialists, breast cancer specialists, and so on and so forth, so that um, we, we, we match the equipment we have with the knowledge we have. And then don't forget, you cannot bring equipment here unless you know how you are going to take care of that equipment. So a lot of it was originally we buy, buy, buy equipment. We have learned a bit from the managed equipment services that uh, sometimes we will buy sometimes we will lease you know depending on how we see the changes happening to the equipment you know going forward anything that is very ict based you are better off leasing because four years down the line that equipment will not be useful anymore or it will be yesterday's equipment and you want to constantly have today's equipment today i think finally on that one is also the way we, the, the capacity that we are building in the country for all sorts of uh, challenges, may they be malaria, may they be uh, cancer, and all uh, sort of other, uh, both communicable and non communicable diseases, I think we have made sufficient progress to say to ourselves that we are able to cater for ourselves, but we are also able to cater uh, from outside the country. And finally, is this this is the first time that we can honestly say that we have got uh, pri um, public hospitals that are going to match private hospitals that are going to be just as good as the private hospitals is the first time mm -hmm. that this has uh, happened and the idea is to keep that going if you go to some of those hospitals even up country even up country hospitals you will find now private sector people sending people to public hospitals because that is where the better equipment is and that is where the case management you know is probably slightly better you know than in a private hospital so for me as 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 minister for health i'm very proud of that i'm very proud of the fact that we actually kenya can get you know to that position and that creates a challenge it makes the private sectors better the private sector hospitals better because they're saying whoa now we can see you know, the KUs and Kenyatta is improving to, the text, to this extent. We need to up our game, mm -hmm. which means that the public sector hospitals also grow. Then there is a competition between the counties. Every county wants to be known as a county with proper medical care because it is also a political issue. You know, a governor who doesn't have sufficient uh, hospitals or people are dying because they can't, act or they can't get oxygen has got a political challenge. Mm -hmm. So everything is working in tandem and hopefully for the better of our nation. And hopefully for the better. And actually from what you're saying, it's like the pandemic has, is it first tend the, uh, our journey to attaining universal health coverage by I, th I think it has really fast-tracked it. Yes. You know, uh, the, the, the issues that we were going to face in prime, particularly in primary health care, mm -hmm. you know, uh, have been fast-tracked in a sense. Mm -hmm. We still have challenges because what happened is that we also took money that we were going to put in a level one, level two, level three hospitals at the county level. We also diverted that money a little bit towards covering COVID-19. But the experience that we have had, the training that we have had of, of the community health workers, even volunteers, community volunteers, you know, have upped their game. So, and because going forward, we want to adopt the philosophy of family health. And we want to take health to the people rather than people come to health my 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 ambition is to see a lot more doctors go down and visit families 
you know, so that uh, you take a walk or you drive and you see this family, there's a pregnant mother and you want to know how she is doing, you go to the next place. And from the level two hospitals, though that should be the base that uh, people spring from in order to go to the communities so that we don't just wait until a person is sick in order to treat them. Had you gone to them and taken uh, maybe a diabetes, check their blood, sugar, their, their, their blood sugar levels and so on, check whether they have got malaria, it would have been a lot easier to treat them at that point mm -hmm. rather than wait until they are completely sick and then they are in a hospital. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the whole thing is a change, a paradigm shift is a paradigm shift and i know it's very difficult right now you know it's very difficult right now for both suppliers who are the doctors and the consumers you know who are the patients to to just see what the the, the impact of what i'm saying but the impact of it would be to change to change the entire healthcare structure you know that we have today and i believe we to then to emphasize a lot more on prevention rather than on cure. We have spoken about other measures that we think are critical. For example, the issues of hygiene. But we cannot talk about hygiene and primary health care without the involvement of the county governments. Cleanliness in a county depends entirely on the efficiency and effectiveness of a county government. Therefore, if you go to a market and the market is dirty, the market has no clean water, the market has no clean toilets, that's a potential cholera outbreak area but if you have got proper toilets in there even if the market people have to pay for it if you have got proper toilets if you have got sanitation areas if you demand of people that they keep a certain modus operandi as far as the health and cleanliness is concerned we will bring down the burden of disease and therefore spend a lot more resources on productive areas Unproductive. Unproductive. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. I welcome your parting shot, especially to Kenyans who miss your daily briefings. <laughs> well, the only thing I can tell you is two things. First, they must appreciate that anybody can get this virus. And the second part is that they must not treat this disease normally. Because if they do, it will treat them abnormally. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, sir. It was a great honor time. having you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being part of this conversation that has been held. Cabinet Secretary Mutai Kagwe speaking about the pandemic situation, the healthcare situation in the country. Thank you once again for your time. I'm Purity Sale. God bless. Mm -hmm.